For number 38, we're asked to solve the equation. So here we have basically two different approaches. You can solve using substitution, or you can multiply um, everything out, combine your like terms, and then solve using either factoring or the quadratic formula. I'm going to work through it first using substitution. So if you notice, we have we have um, you know x minus 5 squared minus 2 times x minus 5 minus 15. So if I were to replace this with, say, a u, I let u equal x minus 5, then I have the equation u squared minus 2u minus 15 equals 0. And this is a pretty simple quadratic equation. I can solve it, again, factoring the quadratic formula. So I'm going to go ahead and solve by factoring. So I have u and u, 5 and 3 will work. You have to have different signs because of the negative 15. So a negative 5 and a positive 3 will give me my negative 2. Now we set each of these equal to 0, so we end up with u equals a 5 and u equals negative 3. Now I have to go back and, you know, remember substitute what u was. So u is equal to x minus 5. So if u equals 5, then x minus 5 equals 5. And likewise, if u equals a negative 3, then x minus 5 equals a negative 3. And now I solve these two linear equations. So adding 5 to both sides, we have x equals 10. And again, over here, adding 5 to both sides, we will get x equals a 2. So I have my two solutions. The nice thing about substitution, um, because this was a pretty simple example, but they can be much more complicated, and in which case substitution is a very, very nice way to go. An alternate method for this one here is, like I said, I could go ahead and multiply it out. So I have x minus 5 squared, so x minus 5 times x minus 5. i got to FOIL that or use the formula. And then negative 2 times x minus 5 minus 15 equals 0. So foiling will get x squared minus 5x minus 5x plus 25 minus 2x plus 10 minus 15 equals 0. Now I combine my like terms, so we will have um, x squared and then minus 10x, so minus 12x and then 15 plus 10, I'm sorry, 25 plus 10 minus 15 gives me 20, so plus 20 equals 0. And now I have my equation. It is in terms of x, again, factor or formula. Um, so I'm going to go with x and x. 20, there's a couple options, but 2 and 10 is going to give you back my 12. Um, it's positive 20, so these signs have to be the same. Making them both negative will give me my negative 12x. All right, now set both of these equal to 0, and we have x equals a 2 and x equals a 10. So the same answers. Like I said, in this particular example, it, it, you know, it, it really wasn't a whole lot of work either way. But, you know, now if I have something like x to the 2 fifths minus x to the 1 fifth minus 12 equals 0, substitution works pretty well. Or if I have 3x minus 7 squared plus 2 times 3x minus 7, uh, let's say um, minus 15 equals 0. Again, substitution would work really nicely for this one. Number 40, solve the equation. In this case here, I have an absolute value equation. So recall that with whenever you have an absolute value equation, you're going to end up with you know, two, two equations or two inequalities, depending on you know, what we start off with. Right. Now before we break it up into the two equations, we need to isolate the absolute value first. So again, our, our goal is to have the absolute value of you know, whatever equals some number and then our little trip will work. So I'm going to start by bringing the 4 over, so subtracting 4 from both sides, and I have the absolute value of 5x plus 3 is equal to a 7. At this point, I can separate it into my two equations. So if 5x plus 3 equals a 7, then the absolute value will be a 7, or if 5x plus 3 equals a negative 7, then the absolute value of 5x plus 3 will be a positive 7. Now we get to solve these two equations. I mean, both of these are um, simple linear equations, so you know you can skip a few steps, subtract three from both sides, you know, in your head. So you have five x equals four. Dividing by the five, x is equal to four fifths. For the other equation, we pretty much do the same two steps. So subtracting three from both sides, we'll have five x equals a negative ten, 
and then dividing by the 5, we will have x equals a negative 2. So these are my two solutions. So again, remember absolute value, immediately think I need to separate it. In order to get rid of the absolute values, I have to have two equations. Um, and the other thing is make sure that you isolate the absolute value before you separate them. So for number 43, we're supposed to solve the inequality, and we're going to write our final answer using interval notation. Okay, anytime I give you an inequality, I'm going to ask you to write your answer with interval notation. Most of the steps are the same um, for a linear equation. Um, we just have two little differences. So let's go ahead and we'll start solving this one, and then I'll, I'll point out the, where that, that difference comes in. So when I'm solving this here, I look, I notice I want to you know, simplify each side first, combine my like terms. So I get a negative 12x plus 12 is less than or equal to, distributing again the negative 3, I get a negative 9x plus 6. Um, and again, since it's linear, x is to the first power, I'm going to bring all my x's on one side, all my constant terms on the other. So I'm going to add 9x to both sides. And that's going to give me negative 3x. And then I'll subtract the 12 from both sides. So a negative 3x is less than or equal to a negative 6. Now the next step is to divide by a negative 3. But anytime you multiply or divide by a negative, you have to reverse the inequality sign. So I have x is greater than or equal to a positive 2. Okay, so that's one of the differences. So anytime you multiply or divide by a negative, reverse the inequality. Okay, and the other difference is, again, how my, um, what my solution set looks like. I have an interval. I have many, many numbers. If it helps you to graph it first, you can go ahead and, and you know, graph, do a quick graph. There's zero, there's two. Real numbers that are greater than are going to be, you know, to the right. Also remember about our endpoint, if it's open or closed, since it's greater than or equal to, it's going to be closed. So we're going to be using the square brackets in that one. Okay, so interval notation, always reading left to right or smallest to largest. I'm going to start at 2 and go on to infinity. Always a parenthesis on infinity. And this time I'm going to have a square bracket on the 2 because it's closed because of the or equal to sign here. Number 47. Greg is opening a car wash. He estimates his cost equation as c equals 9,000 plus 0.09x and his revenue equation as r equals 1.75x where x is the number of cars washed in a six-month period. Find the number of cars that must be washed in a six-month period for, Craig, for Greg to make a profit. Okay, so there's two things I, I, I need to start with. One, like I said, I am given function, so I want to take a moment just to make sure I understand what it is I have. So we know that the cost is given by c of x, so c is equal to my cost function. And then also that the revenue equation is given by r. So r is going to be my revenue. And then x is going to be the, we're told, the number of cars that are washed in a six month period. So number of cars and six months. That might be important because if I look over a two year period, I'm going to have to make some adjustments for that, but six month period. And so then what's the big question? What are we asked to find? We want to know, find the number of cars, so that means I'm going to be solving for x, that must be washed in a six month period for Greg to make a profit. Okay, so what has to happen in order for Greg to make a profit? So you have a profit when your revenue is greater than your cost. So the money that you're bringing in, that's your revenue, exceeds your cost, the money that you're spending. Okay, so we need to figure out when revenue is greater than cost. That's going to be my magic equation. So my revenue function, we are told, is 1.75x. I want that to be greater than my cost, which is 9,000 plus 0.09x. All right, so now you do whatever it is you have to do to solve this linear inequality. So I'll start by taking the, you know, the 0.09x from both sides. And I'm going to end up with um, it's 1.66x greater than 9,000. And now dividing by 1.66, I might get some decimals here. That's all right. I have x is greater than, uh, let's see, it's uh, 5,421.68. Six, 
7. Okay, so now I know what x has to be greater than. Go back, reread the problem, figure out what your answer needs to, you know, how your answer needs to be written, you know, what the label is. So again, we were looking for the number of cars. So I can't have, you know, 5,421.6 cars. And again, we weren't looking for when it was going to be exactly equal. We want to know when it's going to be greater than. So I'm going to have to go with the number of cars is equal to 5,422. I have to round up. I can't do a fraction of a car. If I round down, then I'm going to be a little bit under. So in this case, you would always want to, or always need to, round up to the nearest whole number, regardless of this decimal part. Okay, so my answer is going to be 5,422 cars. And again, don't forget, I am going to be um, looking for proper labels with applications, so make sure that you know what it is you're measuring. Number 50, I am asked to solve the compound inequality. Again, when you're solving inequalities, it's important to make note whether you have a linear inequality or if it is a polynomial or rational, because those are handled very differently. But here, you know, my variable on the x is a 1. This is a nice linear inequality. Now, this one also is a little bit different than the others. If you notice, I have, like, two inequality signs. I've got three sides. So this can be handled in two ways. It is always safe to go ahead and break it up, because what this means is I need 11 is less than or equal to 3 halves x plus 8, and at the same time, um, th sorry, it's 3 halves, 3 halves. So 3 halves x plus 8 has to be less than 23. And I can solve this inequality, solve this inequality, and then my answer is going to be their intersection, or it's both. And that'll work here. Um, and that'll always work on these. But this particular one, I can do all three sides at one time. And, I'll, and I'll, when we're done with this, I'll show you when we uh, an example of where we could not do that and why it wouldn't work. Okay, so if you're here, if you just look at one half of the, just go ahead and look at one half of the problem, you know. So if I've got, you know, this part here, for now. So let's say I only had this half right here. What would you do first? You'd say, oh, I'm going to subtract 8 from both sides. So the difference is, is we're going to go ahead and subtract 8 from all three sides. So subtract 8, subtract 8, subtract 8. And so now what I'm left with is 3 less than or equal to 3 halves x is less than um, maybe 15. Or if you preferred, you could have gotten rid of the fraction first. Okay. Um, now if I go ahead and I say, well, what I have to do, um, you could you know, clear your fractions, multiply through by the 2. Um, some of you will go ahead and multiply by 2 thirds. That's fine. Um, I'm just going to do it one step at a time. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of my fraction and multiply by a 2. And so now I'll have 6 is less than or equal to 3x is less than or equal to 30. And then my last step is to divide all three sides by a 3. And we'll have 2 is less than or equal to x is, I'm sorry, this is not a less than or equal to this, this one here is just a less than. So it's less than or equal, I'm sorry, it's less than. Is less than 10. Um, again, if we could go ahead and graph this if you want to first, um, but notice that x is the real numbers between 2 and 10. So we're going to go from 2 up to 10, less than or equal to 2, so I'm going to use a square bracket, I'm including 2, and parentheses in the 10 because I cannot use 10 as part of my solution set. Like I said, so the other the other way to do this is to, you know, go ahead, I could solve each of these separately. Um, over here, when I do this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and um, clear the fractions first. So not that it, it doesn't make any difference which order you do that in. So if I multiply through by the 2 first, then I'm going to have 22 is less than or equal to 3x plus 16. I can subtract 16 from both sides. So 6 is less than or equal to 3x. Divide both sides by 3. So x is going to be greater than or equal to a 2. Same thing on the other one. Multiply both sides by... 2 to get rid of my fractions, and so I'll have um, 3x plus 16 is less than 46. Subtracting 16 from both sides, we'll have 3x is less than 30, 
and then dividing by the 3, x is less than 10. So how do I put these two together? And remember, this is and, so I want to where they overlap. So if I draw them together, there's my 2, here's my 10. So I want to be, um, x has to be greater than or equal to 2. So greater than or equal to 2 is here. And then I also have to have x is um, less than 10. So starting at 10, I've got to be less than 10. So where do the two overlap? Right here in between 2 and 10. And so my answer is going to be from 2 to 10. Again, open on the 10 and square bracket closed on the 2. All right, so does this always work? And the answer is no. Um, if you have it set up where the variable is only in one place and the variable is in the middle, kind of like we had over here, so the variable is only in one spot, it's in the middle, then it will work. But if I have an equation like x plus 3 is less than or equal to 3x plus 7 is less than or equal to 2x plus 12, then it won't work. Um, as I try to solve this, you know, I can subtract 7 from all three sides. So then I get x minus 4 is less than or equal to 3x is less than or equal to 5. But then what happens, I'm sorry, 2x, let me fix that real quick. Um, I get 2x plus 5. Now when I try to get the 3 alone, you know, I can try to get the x alone. The problem is, is I have x's on all three spots. And there's not going to be any way to fix this. So I have to go back and say, all right, none of that's going to work. I cannot do it this way. I'm going to have to break it up into the two equations, and then I can go ahead and solve each one of them individually and then combine my answers. So I would have to go ahead and solve x plus 3 is less than or equal to 3x plus 7. And then I need to solve 3x plus 7 is less than or equal to 2x plus 12. So again, I would solve both of these individually, and then my answer is going to be their intersection. I'm going to go through this really quickly because, um, like I said, the, the others are what you're going to see. So if I subtract the 3x from both sides, I'm going to have a negative 2x, and then subtracting 3 from both sides, I will get, that's a plus 7 there, I will get um, less than or equal to 4. Then dividing by the negative 2, x is going to be greater than or equal to a negative 2. Remember to flip this because I divided by a negative. On this one over here, same thing, I subtract 7 from both sides. So when I subtract 7, I'm going to get um, 3x is less than or equal to 2x plus 5. And then subtracting 2x from both sides, we'll have x is less than or equal to 5. And now I'll go ahead and graph these together. There's my negative 2, there's my 5. So greater than a negative 2, less than 5, it's going to look this. And my answer is where the 2 overlap. So it would be from negative 2 to 5. And both of these are square brackets. Okay. So I just wanted to show you like one other possibility for these. Okay. Right, so for number 54, I have an, um, an absolute value, and I also have an inequality. So the same thing happens before. Remember we said with an absolute value, anytime you see the absolute value, you need to go ahead and think, you know, I have two two equations, or in this case, two inequalities. And also, you need to start by isolating the absolute value first. So we want the absolute value of some stuff is less than or greater than number. So over here, I'm going to start by subtracting the 7 from both sides. And we will have the absolute value of x minus 5 is less than or equal to 7. Now I'll split it up into my two inequalities. So if x minus 5 is less than or equal to 7, then the absolute value will be less than or equal to 7. Um, the other possibility is if x minus 5 is greater than or equal to a negative 7. So we have to flip it and change the sign. Then my answer will also work. So solving both of these, so these are, are nice linear equations, adding 5 to both sides, I will have x is less than or equal to 12. And then on the um, second inequality, adding 5 to both sides, x is greater than or equal to a negative 2. The other thing is I have to figure out, is this an and or an or? So if you have the absolute value is less than some number, this is going to be the and. So I think less than is the and. And if you've got the absolute value is greater than a number, that will be the or. 
Okay, so this one is a less than, so I'm looking for the, the intersection of the two. Um, if you can do that without graphing, that's fine, but if you are not certain, go ahead and do a quick graph. So I want less than or equal to 12, so down here, greater than or equal to a negative 2 up here, and so the overlap is between negative 2 and 12. And so my answer written in interval notation will be negative 2 comma 12, and my endpoints, because it's you know uh, less than or equal to, that means I'm including my endpoints, we should use square brackets. Okay, 59, I have another inequality, but this time notice that it's an x squared. So this is no longer a linear inequality, this is a quadratic inequality. Um, you also might want to think of it as just being a, um, it's non-linear. It's non okay, so with these we had a completely different approach. We said, all right, I need to go ahead and think of this as being a product or a quotient. So my, my, my uh, approach is to go ahead and write it, you know, as, as factors or as a quotient. So I'm going to go ahead and set this equal to zero, and then I'll factor it. So I've got 12x squared minus 11x minus 1 is less than zero. When I factor, um, let's see, I need to get the 11, I'm going to have to go with 12x and 1x, and then the 1 is 1 and 1. One of these is positive, one is negative. I want a negative 11, so if I have a negative 12 and a positive 1, that'll work. Okay, so now where it's going to get different. So like right now, like I want this product to be negative. Do not do this. This is, this is like a no. Do not do this. No. <laughs> if you take 12x plus 1 less than 0, and you take x minus 1 less than 0, and you solve these, that's not going to work. Because then what you end up having is a negative here and a negative here, but a negative times a negative is not going to be less than 0. A negative and a negative is positive. So this doesn't work at all. And so like I said, that's why we do not use this. Do not do that. We've got to do our, our plus and minus chart. So we're going to break this up into regions of the real number line, and we have to pick a, a, a test point from each region. We said, now where do they, they split? So our, our, I call them partition numbers because of things you might do if you take calculus. So you set these equal to 0. So I'm going to set 12x plus 1 equal to 0, and x minus 1 equal to 0. And those are going to give you your partition numbers. So that'll tell you where the sign can change. So that tells you where the sign of each factor can change. So x equals a negative 1 12th or x equals a 1. So this is what we're going to use to break it up. So here's 1, and here's a negative 1 12. And again, the sign can only change. So for this factor, 12x plus 1, it can only change at negative 1 12. So it's always going to be one sign here, always one sign greater than that. Same thing happens for x minus 1. It can only change signs at x equals 1. So it'll always have one sign when x is less than 1, and a different sign, or only one sign, when x is greater than 1. There's a couple ways about going about doing this. Um, I'm just going to show you one way here. So I pick a test point. It can be any test point you want. You know, but it has to be between negative infinity and negative 1 12th. What if I go with a negative 2? So if I let x equal a negative 2. What happens when I plug it into this product? And again, this is the part where I don't really write everything down. I'm going to do it here just to, to show you. So I've got 12 times a negative 2 plus 1. Well, that's a negative 24 plus 1. That's going to be negative 23. It's a negative. Then I have to also plug it in for the second x. So I have a negative 2 minus 1. That's going to be a negative 3. It's a negative. And when I take a negative times a negative, I get a positive result. And now I didn't need to do that for each region. So what's a nice easy test point between negative 1 12 and 1? 0 is a great test point, so I would use 0 anytime you can. So again, when I plug in a 0 for x, so I get 0 plus 1, that's a positive. Plug in a 0 for x, 0 minus 1, that's a negative. And then it, the product of a positive and a negative will be negative. And now anything greater than 1, any test point you want to use. 2 works fine, so does 3, 4, and 5, so anything you're comfortable with. So if I would go with 2, you're going to get 12 times 2 is 24, plus 1 is 
positive. And then 2 minus 1 is positive 1, so it's positive. And the product of positive and positive is a positive. So now I know where each region is positive, where each region is negative. We we'll use this again later on when we're graphing polynomials. But for right now, I just need to know where is it positive, where is it negative. Well, we are asked to find out, our question was, where is this going to be less than 0? So less than 0, those will be the negative numbers. So my answer will be the interval negative 1 12th to 1. Since it's less than but not equal to, I use parentheses on both sides. We have a similar approach um, when we solve rational inequalities, and those are the ones with the, the fractions. Number 60. Okay, so here I have an example of a rational inequality. So on this one here, like I said, we're going to use the whole idea about a positive divided by a positive is positive, or a negative and a positive is a negative. So we're going to use that concept again. So we are going to have to figure out where is the numerator equal to zero, where is the denominator equal to zero. We need to look at all the factors. Those are the places where the sign can change. So looking at my numerator, I've got 5x plus 3 equals to zero. So solving that for x, I get um, you know, 5x is a negative 3, so x is a negative 3 fifths. And if you can just do that in your head, that's, that's great. And then I also have my 9 minus 3x is equal to 0. So if I bring the 9 over, I've got 3x equals a negative 9. Sorry, negative 3x equals negative 9, so x equals a 3. So these are going to be my partition numbers. That's how I'm going to break up the real number line. So I have a negative 3 fifths, and I have a positive 3. So the intervals I'm looking at are going to be negative infinity to negative 3 fifths, negative 3 fifths to positive 3, and then positive 3 to infinity. I just need one test point per region. And my goal is to find out if it's negative or positive in that region. And then I can worry about the quotients. So what's a good test point over here between negative infinity and negative 3 fifths? Like I said, be careful what you choose when you got fractions. You know, so negative 1 works, negative 2. I'm going to go with negative 5, pick something way over there. So that's my test point. So again, where am I plugging it in? I'm plugging it in for all the x's in the original. So again, I'll show you just the first one. So I got 5 times a negative 5 plus 3. So I said, well, that's negative 25 plus 3. That's a negative 22. Okay, so I get a negative. In the denominator, plug it in. So I got 9 minus 3 times a negative 5. So that's going to be 9 plus 15. That's going to be a positive 24. It's going to be positive. So what's a negative divided by a positive? It's going to be a negative. So no matter what number I plug in from that interval, I'm always going to get a negative answer. The numbers will change, but it's going to be negative. Okay, a nice easy test point between a negative 3 fifths and a positive 3 is going to be 0. So again, I'm plugging in in the same two places. So 5 times 0 is 0, and 0 plus 3 is a positive. In the denominator, I plug in a 0, so I got 9 minus 3 times 0, so I got 9 minus 0. That's a positive, and a positive divided by a positive is positive. And now for my last one, anything greater than 3, I can use 4, I can use 5. I'm going to go with 4. So plugging in the numerator, i got 5 times 4 is 20 plus a 3. That's positive. Looking at the denominator, plug it in 4, so i got 9 minus 12. That's going to be a negative. A positive divided by a negative is negative. This time I was asked to go ahead and find the ones that were greater than or equal to 0. So greater than or equal to 0 are going to be positive numbers. So I'm looking at just this region right in here. So I'm going to go from negative 3 fifths to positive 3. Now should I use parentheses or square brackets? Well, since it's greater than or equal to, it looks like I should use square brackets. But I'm going to use a parentheses on the 3. And why should I use parentheses here? Why not a square bracket? What happens if x equals 3? If I let x equals 3, then I'm dividing by a 0. And we know that we're never allowed to divide by 0. So I have to go ahead and use parentheses on that endpoint. 